Hey everyone, this is David Pike, the Motor City Mechanic. Now in today's video, we're going to be talking about some terms that we use in the industry to describe engines these days. Mainly whether or not it's interference or non-interference, and if it's freewheeling or non-freewheeling. So make sure to check it out. Now the head's been removed on this engine because it's got some bent exhaust valves. So while it's off, it's the perfect time to go ahead and talk about the difference between interference engines and non-interference engines. Now depending on who you're talking to, you may hear different terms describing this. You may hear someone call it freewheeling, which is basically the same thing as being non-interference, or non-freewheeling, which means interference. But either way, they all basically mean one thing. Does the engine have the capability of damaging the valves if the piston comes all the way up and something's wrong either with the chain or the belt and the valves come down? Is there going to be contact between the piston and the valves? And there's one other thing we'll throw into the variable in just a minute, but for right now we're just going to be talking about piston to valve contact. So that's the difference between interference and non-interference. Now it's all about the design of the combustion chamber and the top of the piston and the location of the valves in the cylinder head. Now let me jump in here real quickly. Now I just talked about a possible failure with either the chain or the belt. And I think it's real important to kind of elaborate what those failures could be because cause and effect plays an important role. Now if a chain, when it comes to a Chrysler vehicle, chains aren't really known for stretching or for breaking, but you could have a problem with the hydraulic tensioner or a guide. If either one of those fails or something happens to that, it can cause the chain to start jumping teeth. And over a period of time, the more teeth it jumps, the possibility that the cams are no longer lined up or the cam and the crank are no longer lined up. Then there's the potential for damage. Now if the bell Obviously, we can have a broken belt. That happens over time and age. Also, some of the teeth on the belt can break off for the same reasons. Other failures could be the tensioner and an idler pulley bearing blocking up. You could also have a problem with the water pump leaking. Because on the 3.5 liters, if a water pump starts leaking, it can actually cause the belt to jump. And if it jumps enough, once again, you've got an issue with the cam and crank or either one of the cams not lining up. Now the third and last thing that could cause this is somebody not installing or working on the vehicle properly. Like on the PT, they could over tighten the cam sprocket bolt and shear the pin. There's a lot of different possibilities. There is mechanical failure and then there is going to be human failure. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump back to the engine. Now looking at the piston in this 2.4 non-turbo PT Cruiser, you can see that it's not the typical design that we're used to. We're very familiar with the flat top piston. Now, what they've done on this design is they've actually machined some provisions right here for the intake valves. So as the piston comes up, intake valve goes down, it doesn't make contact in this area. It actually has a little bit of tolerance or a little bit of room to give. Now the issue we run into is on the exhaust side. We don't have those provisions machined in over here. So is there the possibility that the exhaust valve could hit the piston? very possible because this piston actually protrudes above the block and into the combustion chamber portion of the cylinder head. So we don't have all that space that's available when the exhaust valve or intake valves come down. So that's something we'll jump into shortly. Now another important detail that plays a key role in determining whether or not an engine is interference or non-interference is how far that piston travels in the bore or the cylinder of the block. We mainly want to see how high it comes because based on the design of the top of that piston, that could cause an issue. I want to go ahead and rotate this crankshaft and we're going to get this piston to top dead center. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate it. We're going to get to that point where it starts reversing direction coming back down and we'll back it back up. So that right there is top dead center. If you look at this section right here, this is the intake side. This flat portion is approximately a quarter inch lower than the deck of the block where the head would bolt to. So that gives us a little bit of room for this intake valve to actually extend into the cylinder. We've already got the notches machined in, or the provisions as I keep calling them, right to there. We can actually extend that intake valve without having to worry about too much interference or making contact possibly with that piston. 
The problem we run into is on the back side of the piston where the exhaust valves are. As you can see right here, this piston actually raises up. The highest point here is approximately a quarter inch above the deck of the block, meaning this actually extends into the combustion chamber portion of the cylinder head, which brings it even closer to the exhaust valve, which means that there is the potential for possibly hitting it if something like the timing belt breaks. Let me show you what an engine looks like that has a flat top piston, and we'll look at the stroke as well on that. Now this particular engine is a 2.0 liter. It's very similar to the 2.4 except that it's a single overhead cam and not a dual. Also if you look at the piston and the stroke of this, you're going to see some major differences. As we rotate it around, you'll see that when this cylinder right here reaches TDC, that is basically flush with the deck of the block. So there is nothing recessed there to help with the valve clearance. Also we don't have any machine provisions either for the exhaust or the intake valves. So on this engine, if anything's protruding into that combustion chamber of the block, it's going to get hit by this piston. Now when it comes to an interference engine, not only does the piston play a key role, but so does the layout of the cylinder head, mainly the location of the intake and the exhaust valves. The further out to the edge of the cylinder head they put it, the further it's going to extend into the combustion chamber, meaning it's going to get closer and closer to the piston. Now if they move it closer to the center of the cylinder head, it's less likely to happen. But they run into another issue, and that is valve to valve contact. So that leads me to the next question. What is the PT Cruiser? Is it an interference engine or non-interference engine? And if it's an interference engine, does the exhaust get bent by the piston or do they get bent by the valves? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you word for word from the service information what Chrysler states this engine is. The engine is freewheeling, meaning it has the provisions for piston to valve clearance. However, valve to valve interference can occur if camshafts are rotated independently. So after reading that statement, I feel I'm more confused now than I was before. On one hand, Chrysler is stating the engine is freewheeling. The piston is designed so that the valves won't make contact. But, now this is a big but, but on the other hand, if something happens to that chain or that belt and they're allowed to either break or jump and the cams are no longer turning together, instead they're turning independently or one's moving and the other isn't, there's a chance that a valve can hit a valve. Now in all my years of working on these cars, I never took into consideration valve to valve contact. It's always been piston to valve. I don't know if I learned it somewhere else, but nonetheless in that last video I kept driving it home. Piston to valve, piston to valve, piston to valve. We did our cylinder leak down. We knew that the exhaust valves were leaking. We knew something had to possibly damage them. So once again, I stepped in with piston the valve. Now, a lot of you left comments below in that last video and the discussion started. And uh, some people had pretty much pointed out that I was incorrect, that they know that the piston won't hit the valves, it's valve to valve. Now, I started thinking about that and, and for some reason it never came to mind. So I did that research, found that statement that I just read to you. And at that point I was taken back and I felt that I was incorrect. I was wrong. I'd been making a mistake all these years. So I left a comment as well. I pinned it to the top so everybody could read it. That there's a possibility I made an incorrect statement. And that I'm thinking about toying with redoing that video to make sure that I include the accurate information so that I'm not teaching you or showing you wrong. A lot of you said don't worry about it, just bring it up in the next series when we actually do the repair. Others stated I should fix it so that no one's getting that wrong information. In the meantime I took the head off and I did some checks which is a good thing because I'm glad I actually didn't change that video and there's a reason why and we're about to get into that. I can read the statement that Chrysler says, and I can analyze it and it starts making sense. 
So I have the possibility to actually checking the vehicle right now with the head off and seeing if I can tell if that statement is correct or incorrect. There's some common sense things we can check. So after that, let's go ahead and jump right to that. So right now we're looking directly above the number four piston. Remember, intake side right here, exhaust side over here. We've got bent exhaust valve. So are we gonna say that the intake valves hit it? Well, just look closely at the top of the piston. You'll see right here in this spot, this spot, that spot, and over here at the edge, we've got some kind of, uh, some kind of impact mark. Those are not machined reliefs, so that's not any kind of clearance for the exhaust valve. That right there, if you line it up perfectly, is the perfect shape of an exhaust valve. Here and here. But yet the service information says that's not possible. Yet we've got marks telling us otherwise. And these marks don't just show up. They're there on each one of the four pistons. So that's telling me that the piston did make contact with the exhaust valve. It wasn't the intake valve hitting it, it was the piston. So once again, the service information is giving us some conflicting information. I can clearly see that that valve has made contact with the piston. And that's both valves on this cylinder. As I go down the line, I'll see that all four of them have the same marks. So now that we know that the service information is incorrect about that piston making contact to the valves, how sure are we that it's correct about the valve hitting the valve? Well, there's one way we can duplicate that. Now I've grabbed the cylinder head. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and installed a lifter and a rocker for one of the intake valves and one of the exhaust valves on the same cylinder. And I installed both the exhaust and intake camshafts. Now if the head flipped over, we can clearly see the intake valve and exhaust valve. Remember, we rotated the camshaft so that the cam lobe was at its highest point. And it was pressing on the rock arm, which pivots over to the valve spring, pressing down on the valve. So this is as far as the intake valve and exhaust valve is gonna protrude into the combustion chamber. I clearly see a gap between the two. I don't see where there's any kind of space difference where they could actually make contact with one another. I'm no engineer. I'm just putting the camshafts in and rotating it around to see if I can duplicate the condition and I'm not seeing it. Now after looking at the piston, it's obvious that the exhaust valve made contact with it. We tried rotating the camshafts to get the valves fully extended to see if they hit each other. Uh, initial glance, I don't see how they can. Maybe as they're going down the road, higher RPM, as everything's spinning and turning, maybe the momentum of the valves going down is enough to go a little bit further and make contact. But in this case, I've got signs showing that it definitely was the piston to valve. Uh, for the most part, I guess it was a lucky guess, right? It's something I assumed a long time ago, but after doing the research, I found out there's a possibility of something else. So I kind of lucked out on it. If you take away one thing from this video, let it be to never assume. Always check things. You may read things and those things may be inaccurate. Take the time to diagnose these vehicles accurately. So hopefully after watching this video, you now got a better understanding about the difference between an interference and a non-interference engine. And that just because an engine is interference engine doesn't mean that 100% of the time that you're gonna have damage to the valves. If you have that situation, make sure you diagnose it properly by doing your cylinder leak down test. So that way you don't condemn an engine that doesn't actually have any issues with it. So if you like the video, please make sure to give it a big thumbs up on YouTube. Don't forget you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you got any comments or suggestions about anything you saw in today's video, please feel free to leave a comment below or you can email me at david at motorcitymechanic.com. Also, if you like to shop on Amazon, scroll down into the description below this video and click on that link. And any purchases that you make will help support this channel. Once again, everybody, thanks for watching.